Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucas Redwood, and I am the manager of music and learning with Bandology. I'm joined here today with Rob Carley. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm well, Lucas. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Rob is an established musician and is also the founder of a charity organization called The Awesome Music Project. Um, so, Rob, can we start off? Can you tell us a bit about, about when you first started playing music? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I've, been, I've been a musician, I think, all my life. You know, when you get to a certain age, you kind of forget when you started. Uh, <laughs> it just seems like it's been a part of your... Uh, part of your history for so long but um i guess like a lot of kids i played music in um in grade school i started on piano and which i i hated initially and then i i rediscovered it about grade five uh or maybe yeah grade five or six i started playing piano again and maybe it was a change in location and geography and teacher or just getting older but then i i started to appreciate it more um but i think maybe the most you know you know the thing that possibly informed my future as a musician was that I started playing clarinet in grade six uh, with one of the sort of itinerant music programs that come through your your elementary schools and um, I was terrible at the clarinet but then I decided to take some private lessons after you know the whatever eight or ten week program had finished and then um, my the private teacher decided that I might be better suited on the on the saxophone uh, possibly because the clarinet was just so terrible <laughs> and the saxophone as everyone knows is easier to play than a clarinet so i i took to that and that was about i guess grade seven when i started really studying the saxophone and so that that's really the foundation of my my musical upbringing was that playing both piano and saxophone um i sort of started to look uh just you know at the at this at the, idiomatically the different types of styles of music that you find in saxophone like jazz rock classical all that stuff and then on the piano side, I was doing more of the theory and composition side of my upbringing, which is kind of what I do nowadays. And as a as a musician, I think I sort of split my time between composing for TV and film and uh, and performing or teaching uh, music. So those are the kind of the two hats I think I wear most of the time. That's awesome. Um, and you also are the founder of uh, the Awesome Music Project. Can you describe a little bit about what that is and the history of how that kind of uh, uh, came about? Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a uh, it's a long. It's not, I won't say it's a long story, but um, the, the the foundation started in uh, 2018 uh, or so as an idea by a neighbor named Terry Stewart, and and Terry came to me. Terry is a uh, uh, an executive downtown. He works for a place called Deloitte. He's the chief innovation officer, and he's always thinking about problem solving and always trying to find new ways of addressing um, our, our current uh, challenges. And in this case, he was he was curious about mental health and, and witnessing more and more people talking about mental health. Um, some some close friends and family of his who had suffered from some mental health challenges, and he was thinking, well, how about music? Like, how do we use music? To address some of these challenges because he himself not a musician but a huge long life or lifelong uh, fan of music he came to me and said you know i'm thinking about um the power of music and i want to get a list of like people's favorite songs their happy songs and i'm thinking maybe if i put that list together um i can distribute it to the world and make the world a better place and i said well that's a that's a terrible idea terry it's not going to work <laughs> <laughs> and my thinking, of course, was as a musician and you're a musician, Lucas, know that, you know, everyone's musical tastes are different. And just coming up with a playlist of 10 songs isn't going to quite cut it. But what he did do is he started collecting a few stories. And then I found that to be quite interesting because, you know, we all have a different relationship with music, but we all have, I think for most people, uh, we have a long history of 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 music and just using music in our lives, either in a therapeutic way or as motivation or just as entertainment. And so I was curious about the songs that he was collecting and the stories behind them. And then we started to talk, well, maybe there's something here where it's not so much about the particular piece of music you have, but it's the, it's the narrative behind that. And so we, we started to explore collecting a playlist really of about 100 and 
oh, more than 100, 111 songs. And that formed a book called The Awesome Music Project, Songs of Hope and Happiness. And that book is a collection, like I say, of 111 stories from people from coast to coast, from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some of them are musicians and, and most of them aren't. But some of them are well known, like, you know, Rick Mercer or Chris Hatfield or uh, musicians like Michael Bublé and Sarah McLaughlin. Um, all contributed to our collection of stories about the power of music. And then that sort of, you know, Terry's idea was, well, if we can somehow raise some money, um, we could put it toward research and, and research that would further help to validate the efficacy of music as a therapeutic device in, uh, in like a clinical kind of based thing, like music therapy, for example. And that's why we approached um, the uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health down on Queen Street in Toronto, and they became uh, interested in, in some research projects around looking at the brain and how it changes when exposed to music at sort of the brain chemistry level. And that was, the, that was really the genesis of the Awesome Music Project. And since it's gone on to not just explore research, but more importantly, I, or at least more uh, importantly, during a pandemic, um, uh, some programs that are actually in places like long-term care or in schools or in hospitals that, you know, use music therapy and use different types of music uh, to really explore the way in which we can really help people with our mental health challenges. So that's kind of the essence of the Aussie Music Project um, in a nutshell. Uh, and then we continue to expand and grow and try to, you know, send our message out to different communities across the country, particularly those that are, you know, more remote. And one of the things that we we do is we we look we explore digital music therapy and digital access to tools that can help you with music, or help you with mental health through music. Very cool. Yeah, I think that's awesome that you guys are doing that because I think, especially with uh, the pandemic and everything, it, it's uh, definitely there has been some uh, mental health uh, challenges with a lot of musicians and other other For people. Sure. So providing that resource is definitely something that's uh, uh, very beneficial. Absolutely. So we were talking about before this, this, uh, we jumped on here a bit about, um, IMC. I was a past camper at IMC. You said you were yourself. Yep. Um, and as well as a faculty member. So I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about your experience with, uh, at, at IMC. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I went there as a camper, like you said, I went, I started actually in the jazz program. I think it was, might've been the first year they had it or first or second year when Phil Nimmons was the, um, uh, I guess, artistic director of the jazz program. And when I, and I signed up for that. And when I did, I found out about, about the band and orchestra program. And I signed up for that as well. And so I went for two weeks in my first time and I, I went a couple of years and, you know, it's, a, I mean, we don't need to, to really extol the virtues of music education on this channel. I think that we all understand the power <laughs> and the importance of, of that. A camp is a really special place because of the connections you make with people, with, with uh, teachers um, you know, the inspiration you get from hearing, uh, you know, either faculty perform or your, your peers perform, the discovery of new music and all of those things happening in a very short period of time, you know, within a week or two. So, and we all know what music camps are like, and even camps that are run by school boards that aren't necessarily as, you know, as, as involved as a, you know, a stay away camp in the woods for eight or 16 days or however long you stay there. But just even small workshops that happen over the course of several days really help to kids to really focus on on just music without any distractions. And it's, you know, I'm always amazed at any camp. In fact, there are camps that I've been involved with that are just much, much shorter. But, you know, IMC in particular, since we're talking about it, about the, the amount of progress that happens uh, in in five or six days is kind of uh, always, always surprises me, you know, and it's it's a it's a testament to how important it is to have those kinds of environments where you're really just focused on one thing and uh you know you're not afraid to try things and you experiment and you grow and i think that's the magic of uh, of music camp absolutely yeah it was with uh, bandology as well we run a band camp and just like you described there it's so cool to see the young musicians come together and, and make music and they've never really met each other on, on day one. And, and they're, you know, by the end of the week, putting together some amazing, amazing music. It's a really cool thing to see. Absolutely true. Yeah. Um, so from a different uh, sort of shifting gears, different perspective, um, I read into, you also do some, some composing as well. So um, 
what kind of approaches every musician kind of has a different approach with going about composing music like do you have a specific uh approach or um techniques that you like to do when you when you compose music (laughs) well yeah i do i mean i um i work mostly in television and film uh i mean i compose for other other things but most of my output is related to picture uh in some capacity and i think for me and for a lot of composers, um, having some kind of, um, what's the word, um, partnership maybe, or collaboration with another medium can all, can often be very inspirational. Now, in my case, it's film, but I mean, the idea of writing music, uh, for example, to, to lyrics, writing, you know, to poetry, for example, or, or taking a poem or an incident or a, a um, a story or something as your k- kind of springboard. I think that's for me uh, really important. I just can't sit down and write music for the sake of writing music. Sometimes it happens, but the results are mixed. We'll say. <laughs> but when I get to write uh, to picture or to a story, and I'm trying to develop characters through music, I find myself in in a good environment that's really comfortable in that place. And so, you know, even writing to spoken word, I've done some work where you're not really writing to picture, but you're writing to something else. And maybe it's a, maybe it's a crutch, you know, one could, a cynic could say, well, you just need to have uh, something else to fall back on because the music isn't good enough to stand on its own. And there's some truth to that. (laughs) But I just find for me, the collaboration between um, the different art forms uh, is a, is a really good place for me to, to start. So you know, like I said, most of the time right now, uh, it's it's just TV and film. And so you're really involved in reading the scripts and looking at the pictures, uh, the footage and trying to be inspired by uh, what is the director or the um, screenwriter trying to say uh, with, with this story and how can I enhance that uh, without getting in the way? So that's kind of our challenge as film and TV composers. Very cool. Yeah. Anything else coming up for um, AMP or your, any other things for yourself in particular? Well, the, the Austin awesome Music Project, I mean, we've been doing a lot of work during the pandemic. We're working with a number of places, like I said before, uh, specifically Grand River Hospital uh, in their mental health unit, and then a few other uh, smaller uh, places where we're trying to set up little programs. Um, one of the things we can't do during the pandemic, obviously, is hold events and fundraisers. And we had done a few which are really effective, I think. And what they are, we call them story songs and science, where we take a story, uh, someone will tell their music story, and then a musician or a group of musicians will perform the music from that story. Um, and then a neuroscientist or healthcare professional will, will speak like a little mini TED talk on what's happening in our brains when we listen to music. And those events have been hugely successful. We've only done a few because our book came out um, on World Mental Health Day in October of 2019. And then we did a number of events and we were all set to go down to South by Southwest and out to Vancouver and to do a few more of these events and raise some funds and raise some awareness. Uh, And then of course the pandemic happens. And so we really shifted to just doing things online and we're trying to figure out when do you go back into doing them and you know we actually run some discussions even last week just about is the fall the right time and do you you know we were invited to come down to go down to california to do some presentations in november and i'm like i don't know if we're going to do that because do you get on a plane and then the whole world shuts down again and yeah what do you, what do, you do i mean so i think we're just sort of not being too ambitious right now uh, and just doing things like looking for programs that are established and partnering with people and looking at, you know, technology as being a tool that we can use. And we're developing an app right now, um, which is sort of uh, to be used in tandem with um, some some either music therapy or therapy programs uh, that just helps to, to look at music as a as sort of a viable tool to help our mental health. Um, and so that's pretty much the awesome music project for now. And then obviously we continue to fundraise and to, to get the word out and to try to, to look at vulnerable communities like long-term care and try to see how can we make an impact in those places. And then professionally, I'm just, you know, not playing that much. Um, I was fortunate to play a ton <laughs> right before the pandemic. And I do occasionally uh, get together with other musicians to perform. I haven't done a lot of gigs, truthfully, um, but partly because of, choice and partly because there's just nothing not that much available a lot of my regular kind of work disappeared 
which wasn't a terrible thing. I mean, I got to do some, uh, what's the word, self-improvement, I guess. You know? <laughs> uh, so that's okay. And then I'm very, very fortunate as a musician that the film and TV work generally continued right through the pandemic. I have a number of series that I work on that, you know, continued to, to shoot. They were delayed a little bit. Uh, so there was a bit of a hiccup in our schedule, but, you know, I think I worked on four TV series last year in 2020 into, into the beginning of 2021. So that's pretty, I'm pretty lucky that way. And now right now I'm working on two uh, that are kind of going off and they're still shooting. And so, you know, there is, there is a lot of, there was a lot of work done uh, in, in our industry to try to get back to work and to try to keep the lights on. Uh, and so I'm very fortunate that, you know, in post-production, which is what we call composition for music for film, um, you know, we kept going. So that's, that's great to hear. Do you have any advice for um, young uh, students, uh, musicians for interested who might be interested in the career pathway that you kind of uh, chose? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, there's two, two parts of that question. The, the overall arcing kind of advice I give to almost anyone is, is just to listen. Um, and that, you I mean, you can take that in many ways. Listen to, listen to your mom, <laughs> listen to your mom and dad. No, I meant like, that's true too, but listen to, you know, listen, expose yourself to as much music and listen and be a good listener. I think is, is really important and to listen to as much diverse music as you can and different styles and try to be, an, you know, it sounds cliche, but the idea of trying to keep an open mind about music. I think we oftentimes um, it's because we work on a certain type of discipline. Let's say you're practicing scales and you're trying to get better technique on your instrument. We tend to do that. And we tend to believe therefore that, you know, you're validating that exercise, of course. And you really think it's, you know, you, you really want to try to focus on the styles of music that might be related to that. Uh, at the expense of this being more open to ideas of other kinds of music that don't necessarily use that kind of technique as its foundation or building blocks. And I think that's really important to do and not become too narrowly focused on whatever it is that we're, you know, specializing in. And that goes back to my listening idea, listening to lots. And then as far as to get more specific about film and TV, people are always asking, how do I become a film and TV composer? And the big piece of advice I like to give is it's not, you're, you're not really becoming a TV composer, you already are a musician. It's what you are becoming is you're becoming a filmmaker when you work in this idiom, because you're really trying to be more sensitive to what the story is doing. And so, uh, you know, the kind of joke I say is, you know, you listen to music, you know, it's you're better off asking questions like, where is the, where's the director putting the camera and why is the camera there? Uh, rather than what chord is going to work, you know, because you really understand more about how he or she is thinking, which is more important uh, than, and I didn't do that for the first few years of my career. I just, I, I'm gonna write cool music. And it was like, well, it, cool music isn't really, it's, that's just an abstract idea. What's important is music that works with the picture. And to get there, you need to, to work, to think like a filmmaker. So my, my advice to anyone who is interested in film and television is, you know, continue to work on your craft and be a good composer and understand orchestration and understand the range of the contrabassoon, sure. But more, as importantly, you know, watch lots of, of film and listen to uh, listen to the scores, but also look at what's the cinematographer doing? What's the costume designer doing? What are all these people who are so important, as important as the music uh, doing in the, in the filmmaking process? And how do I fit into all of that? Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that advice. Um, all right. Well, we like to end off our, our, our interview series with Bandology with a little quick set of fast five questions. Here we go. Question number one. Uh, favorite movie soundtrack? I'll, I'll go with... Um... I'll go in, I'll go with a Thomas Newman score. Why not? I'm going to say... Uh, I don't know. Pick one. Any of them. Uh, Road to Perdition. It's one of his best. Very cool. How about instrument you wish you played? Uh, well, it's easy. Um, bagpipes, guitar. Um, you know, I can play the guitar, but I play it terribly. I wish I was a really good guitar player. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one's this one's a hard one, but maybe you'll know. Uh, the first uh, two were hard. The first two were hard too. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
what's your hidden talent? Oh, I think I could, I've become a pretty good bread maker. Actually, I think I know what I'm doing. Oh, when I'm nice. Making, yeah. Um, how dream vacation spot? Jeez, I'd love to go. Uh, believe it or not, I want to just go to the far north of Canada. I'd love to go up to like some remote places. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, like places like Whitehorse would be great, but I just even more remote than that. Like, just get me right up to uh, some place you can only fly into and I'd love to explore and just learn and be up there for a while. Yeah, for sure. And last but not least, favorite concert you've attended? That's a tough, no, that is a tough question. Uh, there are so many concerts that I just totally, uh, I totally enjoy. I, I don't even know if I can speak to one. I did see, you know, one that that sort of stands out is is seeing Wayne Shorter at Massey Hall. Um, not long, well, I shouldn't say not. It was about ten years ago now. But it's concerts like that where you're seeing a legend in a legendary place, um, you know, those are really important concerts to me. Uh, they're, they're you don't know what to expect, and you know they 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 always stay with you. I have got a number of concerts like that where I've seen people that I really admire. Um, and uh, I got to see them in a in a setting that I really had liked as well, and you know, th it's always really, really wonderful uh, to see to see a concert like that. Absolutely. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Rob, for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time to speak a bit about the Awesome Music Project as well as your experience as a musician. Thanks, Lucas. Do check us out at theawesomemusicproject.com. All the information is online and you can get our book and you can read stories and see videos and all kinds of uh, resources there at theawesomemusicproject.com. All right. Take care, Rob. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy and research, and our play a gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performance, and interviews on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.